So we today we start three lectures uh, where I'm planning to explain you some at least uh, primary concepts of machine learning. Uh, so this this lecture uh, we will divide into two parts. In the first part, I will try to explain you what is this machine learning thing because it's very popular. A lot of people heard about this and sometimes we think that machine learning is something very, very, um, how to say, magic and uh, some, you know, magicians are working in this field. So basically, with statistics and after statistics, you must be able to understand a lot of things from machine learning from one point. And in the second part of uh, uh, this lecture, I will demonstrate you one particular simplest algorithm that helps us to do the task of classification. So uh, let's briefly summarize what we know from statistics to understand how machine learning uh, differs from statistics and how it is similar to statistics. So first of all, we discussed uh, the issues of collection, analysis, interpretation, presentation and organization of numerical data. So we worked with data, uh, we tried to uh, explore this data, we tried to explain some relationships in this data but most of the um, most of the time uh, we spoke about uh, the estimation of unknown parameters of models that we assume uh, explain this data let's say so the statistics Sometimes people divide statistics into two parts. So one part is descriptive statistics. We more or less skipped this part because our subject is mathematical statistics. And we mostly spoke about inferential statistics. So descriptive statistics is just summarization of data, nice pictures, nice graphs, where you can see how the data is organized, where is the mean, what is the standard deviation, how the frequency of data represented with the help of something like a histogram or bar plot, uh, whatever, or like pie charts. We are doing descriptive statistics in statistics and, and econometrics uh, subjects, but we are doing this uh, as some supplementary exercises, let's say. Uh, well, most of the time, before this lecture we did inferential statistics we were trying to make some conclusions about the entire population based <coughs> on a collected sample so we estimated parameters of the population model we were doing hypothesis testing and we are trying we're trying to reveal some underlying relationships in the data and econometrics basically uh, extends uh, the statistics in this sense uh, because we are trying to work with the model where two variables relate on each other, right? So y equals to blah, 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 x. So what happens in machine learning? Uh, this is one of the definitions. There are many definitions, many books, and uh, the most important well, let's say problem with machine learning that there is no one uh, particular standard in the textbooks uh, when you want to kind of study statistics for example you can open almost any book and almost any book will have more or less similar material uh, machine learning is developing field nowadays and uh, it's kind of a very young field and therefore, in most of the textbooks, you will be able to see a lot of different things covered. And it somehow it's annoying and confusing because uh, for the person it's, it's difficult. Well, I want to have one book, like, okay, large book with 1000 pages, but still I want to have this book and I want to know that when I go through this book, I will be able to know everything about this field. So for machine learning, it's kind of difficult. So that's why this is one of the particular um, definitions of the machine learning. So this is a branch of computer science that utilizes past experience to learn from and use its knowledge to make future decisions. 
you can see some similarities with econometrics because in econometrics we also spoke about predictions we spoke well let's collect the data let's establish some relationship between y and x and let's use this for making predictions and well this is this is right because machine learning takes econometrics as one of the tools well in the textbooks about machine learning you will see something about linear regression regression uh, <clears throat> uh regression models estimating of the parameters and so on so that's why as i said all these fields are interconnected uh and well usually people say that machine learning is an intersection of three fields so computer science uh, engineering and statistics so we still need to know all these concepts from statistics this this is the bad news uh, because we still need to understand the notion of probability, of probability distributions, <laughs> of, of all the related things. But on the other hand, it's about computer science. Why? Because we are working with the computers. So we are doing machine learning. So that's why we, that's why I'm asking you, uh, at least to some extent, master the programming in Python, like be able to write some simplest codes uh, in order to make the progress in this field and basically my personal view is that nowadays any professional in any field i mean it's not only about when if you are trying if you are going to do programming then you need to study some programming languages no i think that any economist like must know at least one programming language uh like one foreign language is necessary would it be like english german chinese or any other language uh one programming language is also necessary because we are living in in times when we are working with the digital data and uh, we must be able as a specialist we are working with, with computers so we must be able to somehow work with this digital data and uh, Excel is not necessary. So I know that Excel is a workhorse of the whole world economy. And uh, like, I don't know, probably 95% of professionals in offices, they work in Excel. But still, if you know something in Python, in R, in some other language like Java, or C Sharp, whatever, uh, you must, you, you will be able to do much more efficiently the same tasks and faster and this will give you some free time to drink coffee while your colleagues are uh, struggling with the data <clears throat> so going back to the machine learning uh, the goal of machine learning is to generalize some pattern again like the analog here is uh is econometrics we are trying to find some pattern in data so i hope you remember from those lectures our example about test scores and class size so we are trying to build some model well this is how test score depends on the class size this is exactly what we are talking here we want to find some general detectable pattern in data so one variable depends on the other variable in this way or or sometimes we don't know whether this pattern exists and this is another interesting field where basically econometrics and statistics are not uh, very useful so we want to create some unknown rule from given examples so we don't know whether some relationship exists but machine learning helps us to reveal some relationships and then we can try to think well i see some interesting pattern in the data i am not able to explain or at least i i, I haven't uh, let's say uh, i haven't uh, expected this pattern but what might be the possible uh, explanation of this and then it gives you some food for thought right uh, you will start thinking well this relationship probably comes from whatever source <coughs> so 
<clears throat> uh, so the main message here that you must understand that we already are doing something in this in this area. We are already studying econometrics, which exactly has this goal to generalize some pattern in the data. Um, well, there are three different types of machine learning problems. Uh, well, this is more or less what you can see in any book from uh, about machine learning. So one is called supervised learning. Uh, we want to teach a machine, so a computer, to learn the relationship between other variables and target variable. Again, this is something similar to econometrics. What does this mean, learn, in this case? It means that we want to estimate the parameters of linear regression model, as, as one example. So this is the learning of the machine. So we want the machine to learn about these unknown parameters. Uh, and this is called supervised learning. So linear regression is one particular example of supervised learning problem. Uh, another example is the classification problem that we are going to study today. At, at, uh, again, one particular example and one particular method for the classification. So the regression problem we are going to cover in econometrics and econometrics too. So there is another branch, uh, another problem in machine learning, which is called unsupervised learning. So we are going to find some hidden patterns and relations in the given data. Why do we call this supervised learning? Because we know the outcome. We know what is the variable x and what must be variable y. And we want to establish some parameters that link these two variables. We, we know the outcome. In unsupervised learning, we know nothing. I mean, we have some data, we have some variables on, on the objects in the sample, but we, are, we don't know whether some objects are similar or they are completely different, if there are some groups in the data in, uh, between objects or something. So we will try to talk about one particular example of this unsupervised learning to give you some sense of what's going on there. So uh, basically with the unsupervised learning, we are doing something which is called dimensionality reduction. So we will talk about this in the end of today's lecture. What is this dimensionality reduction and clustering? So basically what is clustering? We are trying to group different objects together, kind of, uh -huh. So we have a data on, let's say, 10,000 people. And we are trying to, 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 to obtain some similarities. So this group of people is similar. This is another group of people who are similar. And this is the third group of people who are similar. But we don't know what is the criterion, how exactly they are similar. So that's why we are looking for the hidden patterns. It's not about race. It's not about gender. It's not about their profession because all of these things are observable and all of these things can be used in supervised learning but in unsupervised learning we don't know what exactly makes these people similar there is some hidden criterion and or potentially unobservable criterion but we we will be able to at least figure out that these hundred people from the data are similar in some sense. This is a clustering. And that's what I'm, I'm planning to discuss with you about this clustering because sometimes it's a very useful thing <laughs> when working with data. And the third problem is reinforce, uh, reinforcement learning. Well, this is more or less advanced thing and we are not going to go there because you must have uh, more advanced uh, programming uh, skills. Uh, but in this case, the machine learns its behavior based on feedback from the environment. It means reinforced learning. It means that uh, the machine constantly updates the data and the new information comes and this new information teaches the machine what to do. So, for example, for example, uh, the self-driving cars. 
they are teaching from the experience, right? So if the self-driving car goes anywhere and then i don't know crashes in the wall then the machine gets this information because well uh, there was some kind of obstacle i need to avoid this obstacle and then the machine is able to incorporate this new data and in the in the next uh, let's say operations the machine will be behaving with, with the help of this data. So this is something which is uh, related to the artificial intelligence applications, uh, more or less advanced. But again, uh, this thing is more or less based on the previous two. So if you at least know some basics of supervised and unsupervised learning, you will be able to understand how this works. And this is well, I wouldn't say that this is too difficult. This is, of course, this is a professional field and you must have some experience there, but it's not, it's not impossible. Well, and of course, these problems are not separated of each other. In some cases, we perform some unsupervised learning to reduce dimensions. Then we follow with the supervised learning or when the number of variables is very high. Uh, in some cases, the artificial intelligence applications can use supervised learning combined with reinforced learning and so on. So, I mean, these three problems, they can be somehow connected uh, together in different applications. By the way, if there are some questions, you can stop me at any point. Well, now let's compare the statistics and machine learning. Again, this is some subtle uh, differentiation. I mean, it's not like the strong differentiations of here is the statistics, here is the machine learning. As I said, in machine learning, we are gonna use, oh, we are using a lot of uh, concepts from statistics and econometrics as a branch of statistics. Therefore, there is no kind of distinct division. Here is the statistics, here is the machine learning, but some, let's say differences can be listed. So the underlying structure of the data. In statistics, in general, we try to formalize the relationship between variables in the form of some mathematical equations. Remember econometrics again, we assume that y equals to beta zero plus beta one x plus error term. This is the formalization of the relationship between variables. Or if you remember ANOVA, we had some statistical model of ANOVA. Okay. X equals alpha i plus mu plus error term. Again, this is pure theoretical formalization. We believe that our variable has some structure. And this is called parametric model. Why it is called parametric model? Because in this model, we have some unknown parameters and we want to estimate these parameters. We estimate betas in econometrics, we estimate uh, population mean in ANOVA, we estimate population variance when we test uh, equality of uh, means and so on. So those are called parametrics model. We put some structure on our data. And basically machine learning also uses the same, but sometimes in machine learning, we don't need to assume some underlying shape. I mean, it's not like always machine learning doesn't make these assumptions. No, sometimes machine learning does use these assumptions as well as sometimes in statistics. We don't have these parametric models. Uh, but in some cases, and today you will see, today we will study such algorithm that doesn't care about any structure of variables. We don't put any assumptions on our variables. We don't estimate any parameters on the data. So basically some of the machine learning algorithms learn these patterns from the data. Sometimes, as I said, machine learning uses non-parametric models. It's not, uh, let's say, 100% uh, difference, but in most of the cases in machine learnings, we don't make some assumptions in statistics we do 
regarding the probability framework and predictions, in statistics we predict the output with some accuracy, so I put some number here like 85%, but it might be 90 or 95%, whatever, I mean, so we predict some output with the accuracy and we have some confidence about this. That's when we do some confidence intervals, blah, blah, blah. In machine learning, we only care about the accuracy of our prediction. We don't have anything regarding our confidence, which is probably uh, a negative feature of machine learning because we don't know how confident we are with this prediction. Uh, regarding the hypothesis testing, in statistics we do hypothesis testing. Of course, we perform some diagnostics of parameters like p-values, t-values, whatever. So we are gonna do these diagnostics in econometrics, uh, I promise to you. In the next lecture, we will do this. As for machine learning, we don't care. We don't perform any statistical diagnostic. Why? Again, because we don't put any assumptions regarding the structure of the data. We don't assume that there is a normal distribution or whatever other distribution. We don't assume anything about the data. We just have a data and we work with this data. Which in this case makes your life simpler for those who somehow missed the first part of the statistics. These three lectures of machine learning are going to be something new. I mean, so you can start studying from scratch, from zero, because you don't need to remember anything from probability and from statistics. We just throw this away. So here is a list of some popular machine learning algorithms. It's not like the extensive list. There are many different approaches, like, I don't know, 10th or probably even more, uh, but just what we are going to discuss. So K nearest neighbor, supervised learning, that's what we are going to study today. Naive Bayesian classification, that's what I'm going to study with you next lecture. Hidden Markov models, we will skip this part, <coughs> I'm not going to <coughs> discuss this uh, in this course. Support vector machine, so we will see. Probably yes, probably no. Neural networks, I think you heard about this. Well, again, it's not that difficult uh, about neural networks. Uh, it's it's kind of, when you hear about neural networks, you see, probably you, you can think, well, this is something very, very advanced. But if you know econometrics and statistics, it's it's very nice. Clustering, so that's what I'm going to discuss with you also. So nearest neighbor, naive Bayesian classification, probably SVM and clustering. Rich regression, you see the word regression, which uh, yes, which is the similar or more or less similar to uh, econometrics thing, filtering, and, and a lot more other things. I mean, so it's not extensive list. There are linear regression, uh from from study uh, from from econometrics uh, there are some logistic regression that we are gonna study in the second part of econometrics next semester there are many many other things so as i said everything is interconnected and the terminology the last thing that i want to discuss with you because the terminology is annoying after studying statistics, we know the special terminology from statistics like variables, uh, observations, sample, data, whatever. And when you first time open any book in machine learning, uh, it becomes very annoying because people from machine learning field, they call the same things with different words. So that's why I want to give you some, at least, ter terminology from machine learning in order to understand that we are talking about the same things. But uh, so since we are doing machine learning things, uh, I will be most of the cases I will be using the machine learning terminology. But please be, be careful. We are talking about the same things. So, for example, in machine learning, uh, there is a term feature or features. Those features are properties of a given data set. And in statistics, we called them variables like height, weight, uh, gender, age, uh, income, whatever. 
In machine learning, we call them features. In statistics, we call them variables. So please so be careful. Like K. Well, sometimes, like yes. K. Yes, sometimes okay. uh, you can call them keys. Yes, uh, I mean, so just don't be confused. We are talking about the same things, features or variables. <clears throat> Observations. In statistics, we know that in the, each data set, we have a row and this row describes the observation or object, right? Uh, in, the in the data science, we call them instances. If you, if you ask a person about age, income, gender, uh, profession, and the years of education, so all these five things are going to be features, but this person and the row of the data that you will make in your data set is going to be called instance or observation in statistics. And this is M. Uh, well, the number of instances is M. Yes, how many instances you have in your data set. In machine learning, it's instances, and in statistics, it's observation. Basically, we, we, we denote the observation with I. So observation I, first, second, third, fourth observation, and so on, up to N. Yes. <coughs> and uh, dimensions. Well, the word dimension has several meanings and this is even more annoying in the machine learning literature so sometimes dimensions are the number of coordinates in data or number of variables so for example if you have if you ask a person about age and income there are two dimensions in your data two variables and you will be able to make something like a scatter plot two dimensional scatter plot on the x axis age on the y axis income. Uh, if you have three variables like age, income and uh, number of children, uh, then you will have 3D data. If you ask a person about income, age, number of years of education and number of children, you will have four dimensional data and so on. So the dimensions are just the number of variables. Sometimes Dimensions mean the number of entries in a feature vector. What does this mean? For example, if we have a feature gender and we have two responses, male and female, so there are two dimensions. You see that dimension has kind of different meaning in this case and in this case. Most of the cases I will call dimensions the number of variables because it's more sensible, but sometimes Probably in the literature, you will be able to see this meaning of dimensions. Um, ah, yes. And the very last thing is the logic of any, of almost all of the machine learning problems. So how we make our actions when we solve some problems in this case. And that's what I will demonstrate with our example. So first of all, we want to get some problem that we want to study uh, for example today we will try to predict the probability of default of a person based on age and income so this is our problem so collect the data on some measurable features of the studied objects like if i want to predict the probability of default i want to collect the data probably historical data on some bank clients, borrowers who defaulted or who has not defaulted, and some measurable features, age and income, for example. Maybe some other features, of course, but in this example, we will use these two. It, um, can, be, it can be both qualitative and quantitative. Yes, yes, it might be anything uh, which is measurable or at least which you can uh, which you can present as, as, as some number. Like if, if it's gender, like female and male, you can put it zero and one, for example. If there are different, uh, like you had in midterm this, if there is a difference perception of religiousness, right, of religion, you can put it like from one to five. Uh, 
if there is a different level of education like bachelor master or doctoral you can also put one two three something like this uh, well most of the cases even though if, if those features are qualitative you will transfer them into numbers from the okay. Yeah, from the text responses into the number numeric responses uh, if if our goal is to make predictions uh, then usually we want to know how well is our model in making these predictions that is why we split the whole data into two parts or three parts uh, let's start with the simplest case. If uh, we split the data into two parts, one part is going to be called the training sample, and it will consist of 70% of observations, and the rest is going to be the test part. With the help of training part, we estimate our model, or in machine learning, we call this learn the data, right? So we kind of teach the model, uh, and the model must learn from the data about the parameters or some other features. And then, <laughs> so think about regression in econometrics. When we estimate beta 0 and beta 1, we want to make predictions. And we want to use this model on the chunk of data where we know the outcome variables, when we know why. And we want to compare our prediction with the actual value. And this we are doing on the test sample, on this 30% of the rest of the observations. And there are many different performance measures. Well, basically, we are trying to pick the model that performs better, that gives us better predictions. Like, if you remember, R-squared was one of the uh, measures how well the model fits the data. Uh, but there are other things uh, that help us to measure the performance of the prediction on this test set. And then we can use this model, the better performing model, on the new data. Like if there is a new instance comes, we can just get some numbers and predict whatever is going to be the, the result. So you will see the example uh, of this. Sometimes we split the data into training 50%, validation 25%, and test samples 25%. So validation is used uh, in the following way. So yes, we develop the model on the training sample. Then sometimes with the help of the validation model, we tune something which is called hyperparameters. So what are the hyperparameters is the, let's say, some parameters of the model that we set not we don't estimate these parameters we set this uh, we set these parameters ourselves so you will see on the example what exactly is this and then we evaluate the model on the test sample okay so let's stop the discussion about the general features of machine learning and let's see uh, some particular example of the machine learning algorithm. So we will start our discussion with the algorithm which is called k-nearest neighbor. Uh, this is a non-parametric machine learning model. So we don't assume anything about data, we don't assume anything about variables. And the logic of this model is very, very simple. Look, this model memorizes the training observation for classifying the unseen test data. So we want to get <laughs> the training set and with the help of this training set then we want to classify the test data which is unseen to the model uh, sometimes it's called instance based learning so you know what is instance instance is the observation so which means that we the model learns from the observations and uh, also there is a name for this model, a lazy learning model. What does this mean? Uh, it means that the model does not learn anything from the training set. So in econometrics, for example, we estimate the parameters of the model. And in machine learning, we call this estimation learning. 
So basically the model learns these parameters from the data. In k nearest neighbor, nothing similar happens. So the model does not estimate anything from the data. So basically the, the, the whole performance of the model comes on the test part. Nothing happens on the training part. Uh, well, this is a simple technique, but not very efficient on the big data, and we will see why this happens. We can use this for classification tasks, and we also can use this for regression tasks, but I will demonstrate you how this works only for classification tasks. For the regression tasks, if you are interested, you can go read some books and uh, understand how this works. So what is the idea of this? Look, the idea is simple. For example, we want to predict how some person is going to vote in the next presidential election. So we have two candidates, A and B, and uh, we want to predict the decision of this person, whom this person will vote for. Uh, we know nothing about this person. We, know, we don't know any information about this person, but we know what are the decisions of his or her neighbors. So we know how the neighbors are going to vote. And if the majority of neighbors, not all neighbors, but the majority of neighbors are voting for A, then it is reasonable to predict that this person is most likely to vote for A as well. It's very simple. So you know that your neighbors or oh, like you know that the neighbors of some person, the majority is going to vote for A, well, you predict that this person is going to vote for A as well. If you know more about this person, like age, income, number of kids, whatever, we can specify the definition of neighbors, because it's not like geographical neighbors, but probably neighbors of the same or similar age, of the similar income, and of the similar number of kids. Right? So we can somehow affine the, uh, the prediction. So we can use <coughs> this new information uh, based on, on these dimensions. And this is the idea of this nearest neighbor classification. So very simple. So how this works? And you see that we don't have any mathematical assumptions here. We just need to know who are the neighbors of this of, of this of this person, for example. Let's see. So basically we need to know some sense of neighbors. We need to be able to define who are the neighbors and how to identify those neighbors. And then we need to know the information about this neighbor's choice. Therefore, it is not non-parametric model. We don't have anything to estimate. We just need some notion of distance. And we assume, well, yes, one additional assumption, we assume that points that are close to one another are similar. So the neighbors are similar. So uh, let's look at the example. So I took this example from the book of Heckelin. Uh, I mean, not uh, exactly the same example, but I, I, I just got some inspiration from that book. So I can share with you this book uh, if you want. So this is a nice book with a nice explanation of, <laughs> of all the algorithms. So assume that we want to use borrower's age and income to predict whether this borrower will default on loan. This is a problem of binary classification because we want to classify a borrower into one of two groups. Yes or no. Like default or no default. You had similar exercise uh, when you had the categorical data analysis in on the exercise session. 
but you had also categorical uh, predictors. In this case, the predictors are going to be uh, quality, uh, quantity, right? H and ink. So assume that we have the following data training set here. So we have nine observations or nine instances uh, with two features, age and income, and one target variable, default. We have four people who had default. Yes. Uh, we have a random, sam random sample, like as a 100% of a random sample. No, no, no. It's, it's like nine observations. Like, yes, we have some random sample. And out of this random sample, we pick nine observations, which are the training set. Also randomly, right? Yes, this is important thing. When you split your whole sample into training and test set, you must do this randomly. There are also some algorithms in Python that help you to do this. And I will record the tutorial that will show you how to how to do this exactly. Yes, but this is, this, this, is, this is an important question, and you are right. So we need to randomly select the observations for, tra for training set and for the test set as well. And if it is a random sample of a, of a random sample, and if we take another like 50% for the training set or 70, what do we, then our results may change? You're right. Uh, you are asking very, very, very good questions. Uh, well, there is this, there is a procedure called cross validation. Uh, this procedure of cross validation uh, performs in the following way. So you kind of take seventy percent of training set, thirty percent of test set. Uh, oh, okay, no, no, no. It's a bit differently. So, for example, you split your data into five parts, like. 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%. Then you take four blocks as a training set and one block as a test set. Then kind of you evaluate, you train your model, you evaluate your model. Then you take first, second, third, and fifth block as a training set and fourth block as a test set. And you do the same. Then you take the third block as a test set. Then you take the second block as a test set. And if the performance of the model does not change significantly from all these uh, kind of uh, from, from all these uh, manipulations, then probably your model is, is nice. But I decided not to discuss this in this lecture because I wanted to show you more practical things, but we can discuss this in the next lecture, how this uh, performs exactly. Okay, okay. I guess we yes, should... this, 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 is very, uh, this is very nice question, basically, yes. If we change the sample, we also want to get some notion of, 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 of confidence or something, but there is nothing to have confidence about because we don't have any parameters, so you will see that basically it's not possible to apply some kind of hypothesis testing or whatever here. And this randomization, well, gives us nothing. But yes, yes, I, we will try to discuss this in the next uh, lecture, so how this cross-validation uh, works. Okay, so we have a random sample from a random sample. <coughs> uh, well, we have Ages, income, four people defaulted, five people uh, did not default. Um, and uh, in general, we can see that, uh, well, we can put them on the graph like this in the two dimensions. Uh, and with diamonds, with green diamonds, we have those who do not default. And with the red crosses, we have those who default. So we can find some pattern that uh, people who are younger and who have lower income uh, have more probability of default. Uh, people who are older and have larger income, they have less probability to default, right? Because the green points are somewhere here. 
Um, now, how we can pre how with this data we can predict the probability of default for another person? We have nine observations. So suppose that there is a tenth person uh, coming and asks for a loan, and we ask this person about age, about income, and with only this information at hand, we want to predict whether this person will default or not. So this is exactly what this k nearest neighbors algorithm does. So first of all, from the plot, we can see that borrowers with default tend to be younger and have lower income. Not all of them, but there is some tendency. Well, this is probably consistent with the common sense experience and assume that we want to predict the default for a borrower who is 28 years old and has an income of 70,000 rubles. So on the graph, we will put this person somewhere here, right? So the point is going to be here. And uh, it is not clear uh, whether this person belongs to the group of uh, people who will probably default or who defaulted already, or this, is, this person is closer to the people who do not default. Uh, so, first of all, we must define the distance measure. So, how far this person is from other nine person, persons in our, uh, in our training set. For this example, we will use the simplest measure, which is called Euclid Euclidical, Euclidian sorry, distance. Uh, just the measure of distance, like linear distance of this point from every other point. Uh, this is a straight line between points in a Euclidean space. Uh, the general formula is this. So we need to have coordinates of the point of interest, Q. We need to know the coordinates of points of another point, P. And uh, then we sum over the squared uh, distances between every dimension. Uh, and N is a dimension. Basically, in our case, we have two dimensions. But if you have three, four, five, seven, and so on variables, uh, we just need to sum over every uh value of these variables yes p and q are numerical values of points p and q for the dimension i so for example look uh, let, let, let's go back to the table so we have the first instance or observation here uh, a person with the age 29 and income 64 how far this new person with age 28 and income 70 from that point. So we will calculate the Euclidean distance in the following way. We take age of a person from the training set, 29, minus the age of the person under consideration, 28 squared, plus uh, 64 is the uh, income of a person from the training set, from the first person of the training set, minus 70, which is the income of the person of interest. Again, if you have third, fourth, fifth variable, and so on, you just keep adding these squared distances. That's very simple. And then you calculate that the distance is 6.08. This is called Euclid Euclidean distance. So for all other observations, we calculate these distances and now we need to identify those instances from the training set that are closest to our borrower for whom we want to predict the default. So we see that the closest distance is this one. So this is the nearest neighbor, right? And this nearest neighbor defaulted. The second nearest neighbor is this one. And this nearest neighbor does not default. 
And the third nearest neighbor is this one, who also had a default. So we have two versus one. We have two neighbors who defaulted and one neighbor who did not default. So what should, how should we predict whether the person who is 28 years old with 70,000 rubles of income, whether this person default or not? What is going to be our Again. prediction? This person Again. will default, right? Yes. Again, do we pick more than one neighbor, right? Uh, this is a nice question. Look, the algorithm is called K nearest neighbors. So K is the number of neighbors who we, how, how many neighbors we want to take. And we will discuss how we should pick this K. Because K, this is exactly the hyperparameter of our model. The number of K affects our decision. Because look, if you take only one nearest neighbor, the decision is yes. If we pick two nearest neighbors, the decision, so we have a tie because one neighbor has a default, another neighbor does not have a default. And we have a tie, right? So tie means that we, we cannot choose what to do. When we pick three, our decision that to predict a default. If you pick four, where is the fourth closest? If you pick four, again, we have a tie because the fourth nearest neighbor does not have a default, which gives us the first clue. K must be an odd number. K must be one, three, five, seven, nine, whatever. We should avoid an even number of neighbors because when there is an even number of neighbors in this binary classification we will probably have a tie and tie means that we have two versus two and we do not we are not able to to decide okay if we are going to introduce the fifth nearest neighbor the fifth is going to be this one there is a fifth nearest neighbor we have three no's versus two yeses. In this case, when we have five nearest neighbors, our decision is going to be no. You see that the number of nearest neighbors affects our prediction. And this is the sensitive point, how to choose the proper number of nearest neighbors. <coughs> so at this moment, let's stick to three. And then later I will explain you how can we choose properly. Let's stick to three nearest neighbors. So we have two nearest neighbors with yes and one nearest neighbor with no. That gives us a prediction that the person will default. Right? So as I said, basically it's here. We must choose K, the number of nearest neighbors. Let's set K equal 3 and select three nearest neighbors. So we have one, seven, and three with distances given here. And the neighbors one and three have defaulted, the neighbor three have not defaulted. So therefore we have two yeses versus one no, and we vote for yes. So we predict that the borrower who is 28 years old and has an income of 70,000 rubles will default. Well, basically, that is all. This is the whole algorithm of our prediction. Nothing more I can say about it. So, as you see, this is very simple. You just need to calculate how far your observation is from other observations from the training set. Is the idea clear? Yes, this is very clear. Uh, as, as I said, even kind of school uh, pupils are able to, to understand how, how exactly we perform this. Well, here is an illustration. We have this point, this instance, or this observation, and we are not sure about 
whether this person will default or not. We need to predict. Uh, and we see that two neighbors are uh, having default and one person does not have a default. So we vote two versus one that this person will default. <clears throat> so now, how we can evaluate this classifier? As I said, Sorry. there is going... Mm -hmm. And what if our variable is uh, categorical? Uh, we can do the same, even for the categorical variable. In this case, why I decided to give you this example? Because uh, in this example, you see that you will be able to see the whole idea of this method so with the two-dimensional graph. If there is going to be one variable, one categorical variable, uh, and for example, if there is a binary variable 0 and 1, you will have either 0 distance or 1 distance, right? So uh, nothing changes here. You will be also able to calculate the same distances, but you know for sure that if your observation falls in the same category, uh, in the same group, then the distance is 0. If your observation falls in the other category, the distance is going to be 1. That's it. Okay. <laughs> but if we have 3 categories? If we have 3, we just need to give them some numerical sense. Uh, there, there can be ordinal variables like bachelor, master and PhD. So you are not able to become a doctor after bachelor, right? So you must go in some particular order. Uh, if there is no particular order, uh, well, we probably do the same. Uh, basically, let me think about this. If you have something like different industries, let's say, like banking, uh, transport industry, telecom industry, and uh, some production, and those are also categorical variables, but they are not ordinal. Uh, well, my guess is that we also do the same. We give just particular number like banking is one, telecom is two, uh, transportation is three, uh, production is four. Uh, let me check this, how this algorithm performs on the categorical data and next lecture i will i will answer you uh okay. i guess i guess the approach is going to be the same the question is how properly to give the numbers uh, to these categories uh in the case of ordinals ordinal categories it's clear we just give kind of in the particular order when there are categories that are not ordinal i need i need to look how this works Okay, so now, now we turn our attention to the test set. So we have, let's say, four categories, uh, four observations from the test set. So we have uh, four people, and for these four people, we know the actual outcome of their loan. We know that there are two yeses and two noes. And with these numbers, we make using the same model, and using the same approach as I demonstrated, we make these predictions. So I don't show you how we arrive to these predictions, but as I said, these predictions are the same. We take age and income of the first training set observation, and we make the prediction exactly in the same way as, as here. Uh, we calculate nine distances, we pick three nearest neighbors, and then we vote what must be the outcome, yes or no. Uh, then we do this for the second, then we do this for the third, then we do this for the fourth. And then look what, what do we have. So why do we want this test set? Because we see the actual outcomes of our target variable and we see the predictions. And we see that sometimes our algorithm gives a wrong decision. 
because in this case there is a correct decision in this case there is a correct decision and here is a correct decision but in one case there is no correct decision so that's why so there are three correct and one incorrect prediction so that's the stage when we want to evaluate the performance of our classifier when we picked k equals 3. So we want to now evaluate how good is our model when k equals 3. Uh, look, uh, there are several different metrics that are used to evaluate the algorithms in machine learning. So I will show you them and then in the next two lectures we also try to use the same metrics uh, to evaluate the performance of our model. So first of all, before calculating this matrix, we, uh, we build something which is called the confusion matrix. So now what you will see uh, must be familiar from statistics because when we spoke about type 1 and type 2 errors that was almost the same as as here look uh, but again we didn't call that thing confusion matrix and basically that was not a confusion matrix but in machine learning we have a similar object look we have in the rows we have the number of actual yeses and noes and in columns we have the predicted yeses and noes and we count how many instances or how many observations have actual yes and predicted yes and we call this number true positive so the actual is positive the predicted is positive so how many true positives do we have in this case we have one true positive this one the actual observation is yes and the prediction is also yes <laughs> so then if the actual is yes but the prediction is no we have false negative and we have one from that table from the previous uh, slide when the actual is yes but we predict uh, sorry when the actual is no but we predict yes we have false positive we have zero of such instances and finally, there is a true negative when the actual is no and predicted is no. So we have two instances from that test set. Now with these numbers, so in our example, we have this, true positive is one, false negative is one, false positive is zero, true negative is two. And as I said, it looks similar to, uh, to the, table that we that I used to explain you the type 1 and type 2 errors because what is this false positive is this type 1 or type 2 error who remember type 2 yes and this is type 1 type 1 yes yes okay so we had one error which is type 1 error uh okay so now the performance measures so there are several of them one the most obvious performance measure is called accuracy. Accuracy is the proportion of test instances that were classified correctly. So we have three correct predictions out of four. So in the denominator we add true positive and true negative. In the denominator we add all instances together. True positive, false positive, true negative, false negative. And we have 0.75. So 75% of observations predicted in the correct way. This is one very similar, very logical measure of a performance. The second one, precision. So the precision is when yes is predicted, how often is it correct? So look, we need to take true positive and false positive because in true positive and false positive we predict yes. And now out of them we need to calculate how many true positives are there. In our case we have one true positive, we have zero false positive and therefore our precision is one. So when, whenever we predict yes, 
this yes is correct. Recall. Recall approaches this performance differently. Uh, also, it is called sensitivity or true positive rate. When we take the actual yeses, so now look, here we calculate how many true positives out of predicted positives. And in recall, we calculate how many true positives out of actual positives. So when among actual yeses, what fraction was predicted as yes? So we have two actual yeses and only one was predicted. Therefore, we have recall equals to 0 0.5. So, and the name itself explains what, what's going on, right? Uh, because recall means that if I know that there are two yeses, I want to recall them. I want to predict both of them. <laughs> and this is not clear which, which metric is better. Because, well, precision is nice, right? So precision is how many predictions uh, are reliable. And there is 100%. So recall is also a good measure. Because in this case, uh, we want to understand how good is our model in predicting the CSS or positive outcomes. Sometimes we want to combine them. And in order to combine them, we calculate something which is called F1 score. This is a harmonic mean of the precision and recall. Uh, so the harmonic mean is calculated like the number of uh, the number of values. In this case, there are two divided by the sum of their reciprocals, 1 over p plus 1 over r. In this case, it's 0 0.67. Look, if p and r close to each other, f1 increases, which means that f1 is sensitive, so the classifier will get high f1 score if both recall and precision are high. So there is a trade-off, right? So, I mean, if both of them are high, then F1 is going to be high. Therefore, F1 nicely combines these two uh, metrics. And we can use them. So this is out of the scope of the lecture. I decided not to put it and we are four minutes till the end. Uh, but I will demonstrate this in the tutorial. Uh, if we change K, so the question that Vlad asked, for example, what if we take five neighbors? How well is going to be our classification in this case? So we recalculate the performance of our model with k equals 5 based on the test set. We will get another number of uh, other numbers of true positive, false negatives, false positive, and true negatives. And then we can recalculate these performance measures and we can compare when the model when the algorithm works better with k equals 3 or with k equals 5 or probably with k equals 7. This is one possible approach how we choose k. Just compare the performance measures. So I will leave this till the tutorial and probably in the tutorial, not probably, but in the tutorial I will show you how we can choose between different cases practically. But now, yes, coming to this question. So how to choose K? And another question, is there only one option to calculate the distance? Because we used Euclidean distance, but there are some other notions of distance. So how to choose K and how to measure distance? Um, well, the choice of K, it might be either guessing, just okay, let's take three, or let's take one, <laughs> whatever. Uh, or if you want to be more um, kind of fundamental in your thought, then choose a k that is greater or equal to the number of classes plus one. 
So what is the number of classes? This is the number of uh, classes in your target variable. In our case, the target variable had only two classes, yes or no. And plus one gives us a hope that there is no go there is gonna be no tie when we decide uh, how to classify our observation. Uh, well, in our case, there is a three, right? Because we have two plus one. Uh, or, as I explained, we can optimize using an algorithm. So, but basically, we pick such k that performs better in with with these evaluation measures. Well, the question of distance, I'm not going to discuss it here. But just please, if you are going to use this in the future, be careful that there are different, dif uh, different distance measures. For example, we used Euclidean distance, but there are also Minkowski distance, there is Mahalanobis distance, there are some other uh, measures of distance, and they probably will give you different uh, results in 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 your uh, in your models uh well they all of them all, all of them have some pros and cons and uh, some special let's say uh cases when it's more practically let's say better